All right. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Hope you're having a great day. So Unity has just released this video. So it's a Unity 6 uh, GDC roadmap talk. So I figured let's watch it together. I'll share my thoughts and we'll see. We'll see what's the future. I mean, because I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know what they're going to announce. So this should be fun. Okay, let me just unmute everything. And yeah, let's see if it should be interesting. Okay. Has any of you already seen it? It's been about three hours, so yeah. All right, so yeah, basically let's see it. And if I have anything to say, I'll pause, comment, and whatever. Okay, so let me just uh, put the, uh, kind of like that. Okay, great. All right, okay, so yep, let's put it on and let's see. Before we get started, here's our safe harbor statement. This is just a legal statement explaining that you should still do your homework when you choose your tech. So welcome to Unity's Developer Summit and to Game Developer Conference 2024. Today, I'm grateful to be able to present along with a very talented crew, our roadmap for 2024, and maybe a bit of a tease to look beyond. Last year, we announced the next version of the Unity engine, Unity 6, and promised it would boost your productivity and give you the ability to create more immersive worlds with more players, more objects, more assets than you've been able to target before. For today's talk, we decided to look at Unity 6 a little differently. And rather than divide this talk up into individual products or features, we looked at areas of game creation that you asked us about the most. So that's what we'll see today. Oh, that sounds like a great way to set up the GDC talk, right? And by the way, just in case you don't know, uh, I believe they've already uh, released the uh, preview version, which I assume, I believe it's the tech version. Learning about the new version is a bit tricky, but I think I think uh, Unity 6 has already been, the beta has already been uh, around for a while. And now they've got the preview version, which I believe is the equivalent to the tech. So I have to confirm that. But yeah, I think that is correct. So yeah, if you want to try out Unity 6, yeah, pretty much of this live stream, you can go ahead, download and give it a shot. That's pretty much what I'm going to do. But yeah, let's see. Before we dig in, let's take a look at what... Oh, right away. Great stats. 60% are using the 22 LTS. That's really awesome. Yeah, it's... Uh, Although at the same time, that's 40% not using LTS. I wonder what those are using. I guess that's just using older LTS. But yeah, basically, uh, if when in doubt, using the latest LTS. That's usually what you should do. What's been happening recently? We released Unity 22 LTS last year, and the adoption of this latest version has been incredible. In February, more than 60% of all actively worked on projects were done so in Unity 22 LTS. And what's been gratifying is that along with the sheer number of projects being worked on is the fact that we've also improved the quality of the engine in big ways. And we're seeing less issues reported over time compared to previous versions. We continue to release a new build every two weeks. And I want to confirm that we will support Unity 22 LTS in production for some time to come, ensuring that you can have the confidence to continue to build your projects until you launch. Turning our eyes towards Unity 6, there are more than 50 major features being updated. Wow, okay, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so addressables, lots of Android stuff. Build profiles, okay, that's cool. Character hair and skin improvements, that looks awesome. Crash analytics, that's cool. Dedicated server, that's awesome. Server hosting. Distributed authority, this is really awesome for making multiplayer games. Dot swappable physics engines, wow, that's something. Physics. Experimental web GPU support on the last uh, Unite conference. A lot of people were cheering for this. So, yeah, this is some pretty big stuff. GPU light mapper, a lot of GPU stuff. MetaWeb, multiplayer. Oh, the multiplayer center. Oh, this is awesome. This was on the latest Unite. This is a way to put all of the multiplayer tools together in one thing. So, that's really interesting. Real integration, recording. So, yeah, tons and tons of stuff. Are yeah. added to the editor and runtime, Even more. Along with hundreds of minor improvements across the editor. There are thousands of you using the Unity 6 beta. And with Unity 6 preview just around the corner, fully supported in production, you've got a chance to get your hands on with much of what we'll share with you in this talk in just a few weeks. Let's take a look at what some of you and other creators have been creating with Unity this last year. about 
your dreams and memories. Wow, that's really awesome. Every time I see one of these showcases, the main thing that comes to mind is really just the versatility. So many games, all of them look so so awesome, and so and they are so different, like action games, FPS games, top-down games, asymmetric games. There are AR, VR, and right away, Valheim. I haven't played Valheim in about two years, so yeah, definitely would like to get back to that. It's really, it's it's really awesome, the amount of variety that developers can build with the engines. Really just so incredible impressive. to see so many different visual styles, genres, and platforms represented by everyone here. And I'm looking forward to what's next. So these are the five topics we're going to cover today. Creating the most immersive worlds possible, leveraging the efficient game creation tools, our full end-to-end -end multiplayer solution, our platform support, and through all of this, making sure your games are performing great. So with that, let's dive in. So we hear you. You need to create deeply immersive worlds to entice your players to play. You want the most scalable and efficiently rendered visuals you can get without sacrificing performance, and you need ways to create worlds that draw even the most demanding players in. We also learned that immersion isn't just graphics. It's the ability to have your worlds react to players in dynamic ways, in real time, along with many other things. So to begin, I'd like to introduce Matthew, who's going to give a rundown of what we're doing with our rendering pipelines and with Speedtree to give you scalable, immersive experiences. So hi everyone, my name is Matthew Müller and I'm product manager for graphics. Now I talk about it, creating immersive worlds. In the past few years, uh, we've been incrementally building our uh, rendering technologies called script on the pipelines and that most of you uh, know already probably. And we've been uh, consolidating on one side the common set of functionalities so that we have a better variety across the pipelines, uh, improved performance, customization, visual fidelity and artist tooling. And on the other side, we've been reinforcing the unique value of each render pipeline. So for universal render pipeline, it's 2D rendering, VR rendering, uh, optimized mobile performance and customizability. And for HDRP, it is uh, improving physically based rendering and environment. So with uh, all these features coming in six, Oh, it's interesting right away saying that the built-in render pipeline, so it is maintained along the Unity 6 cycle. So it's actually interesting that they're specifically focusing on that while at the same time focusing on these two. So these are going to be default in Unity 6, okay? So yeah, I wonder if they're going to show stats on how many how many developers are using URP versus uh, the built-in render pipeline, because last time I saw those stats, those were still like still like only 50% using URP or HGRP and still like 50% on the built-in render pipeline. So I wonder, by making that default, I wonder if that is going to change in the future, but yeah. Interesting. We think that SRPs are the right place to start with your project. So there will be defaults in Unity 6. And the built-in render pipeline, uh, built-in renderer, will be uh, still available and maintained all along the Unity 6 cycle, uh, which will be a longer cycle uh, than the classical LTS. Oh, that's also an interesting one. Longer than the current LTS. I don't think they've mentioned what is in the future, because now since they've gone away from the number scheme, so we can expect we can no longer expect a new Unity version every single year. So I wonder, so this thing longer than current LTS, so I wonder if uh, Unity 7 is going to be in like, I don't know, 2026, 2027. So yeah, interesting to see this little hint. So on Steam, oh. um, in like 90% of the games uh, that were shipped, uh, released in 2023, 
already use SRPs, uh, a third HDRP and third uh, URP for 3D games, the last third for URP for 2D games. Oh, okay. So it's already at 90%. I thought it was quite a bit less. Okay. So only 10% are using built-in. Okay. So that's interesting. I'm pretty sure I've seen these numbers before. It was like 50. So I wonder, is that a huge boost or am I just misremembering it? I don't know, but that's Seems great to say. And more than 50% uh, of the XR and uh, mobile games also use this. It's, it's based on all this production feedback that we've been shaping uh, 22 LTS and Unity 6. But being used in production doesn't mean it's easy to learn. So we wanted to provide you with uh, all the materials to get started. So first, it's the URP3 samples. Uh, they are available on the Unity Hub directly. And it's four scenes with four visual styles to get you uh, started to be able to deploy on a wide range of platforms from XR, mobile, to PC and consoles. Then it's a 2D Happy Harvest uh, project showcasing 2D lighting, 2D shadows, tile maps, and a, a lot of the URP 2D renderer features. And finally, because building a game is a lot about customization, uh, each of our rendering package uh, contains samples that you can find on the package manager in the editor with a lot of examples uh, of custom shadow graph, custom VFX, uh, render passes, lens flares. But overall, the features yeah, and by the way, all of those are downloadable. So if you haven't seen any of these, definitely go ahead and check it out. I believe they're all available from the Unity Hub. So the URP scene sample, this one's really awesome. It has tons of interesting scenes, all with different renderings. So this is really great. If you're into 2D, the Happy Harvest. I even made a, an overview on this project. This is all really awesome. And the samples this is something that I've been meaning to look at for ages because it looks like it has a lot of really interesting graphic stuff. So yeah, if you're interested in any of these, these are all downloadable stuff. So definitely check it out afterwards. Thanks. A random passes, lens flares. But over all the features, uh, performance is always the number one user request. If you have not watched it yet, we I recommend watching the keynote uh, from Unite 2023, and in particular, uh, the Fantasy Kingdom demo in Unity 6, where it's showcasing uh, the performance improvements that we're bringing. Uh, by the way, um, we spent more uh, like the majority of our development resources uh, on improving performance. And it, we we have three groundbreaking advancements. The first one is a GPU resident drawer, which totally changes the way that we are uh, processing the scene and sending it to the GPU. So uh, we leverage polarization on the CPU and we store it into buffers so that it's stored uh, and it processed directly on the GPU. Um, and since the scenes are now more processed on the GPU, we could add GPU occlusion cutting, which will discard uh, automatically at each frame the non-visible geometry. And finally, to be able to render at 4K or with high shading quality or post-processing quality on mobile, uh, we are introducing our own cross-platform temporal post-processing uh, uh, upscaler, um, which is called STP for Special Temporal Post-Processing. And this allows to render at a small percentage uh, of the frame resolution and upscale to the final resolution with a uh, little lot of uh, visual fidelity. Yeah, these three things are really awesome. I mean, I am not a graphics program, so I love anything in which I just take a button and everything runs 100% faster. So these are really awesome. The GPU resident drawer, these showed some really insane results back when they showed it on Unity 6 at Unite last year. Same thing for the GPU collision calling. And on STP, in case you don't know, this is an upscaler. So basically you can render your game at, let's say half or quarter resolution, then basically auto upsync, uh, upscales the, the entire image up to 4K or 1080p, something like that. And basically it looks really awesome. So yeah, all these three are basically things that you can just take one box and your game runs much faster. Personally, as someone who is not a graphics programmer, these are the kind of features that I <laughs> definitely love to see. Take one box, everything runs faster, awesome. Uh, in Unity, uh, extensibility is key. So we uh, we wanted to mix extensibility with performance, and sometimes it can be challenging, and that's what render graph is for. Uh, so the URP, that's what the URP render graph is for. So the render graph allows to order uh, the render passes so that uh, you can optimize uh, the memory usage which optimizes the memory bandwidth as well for better performance, and but also for uh, improving uh, the battery consumption, which is very important for mobile. 
but it's also uh... yeah that's another thing by the way which is if you improve performance not only does your game run faster if you cap the frame rate that it either you make it run faster or you make it take less power which in terms of mobile means it's uh uses up less battery so it lasts longer so even if you don't like even if you don't need extreme performance then it still benefits you if you're making mobile games that need battery uh customizability framework so you can uh, extend the pipeline through a uh, URP uh, render graph uh, while leveraging these low level optimizations. Now, uh, it's also easy for technical artists to extend the pipeline uh, with uh, shadow graph and create their own custom post process effect, for example. And for VFX artists, they are not limited to the set of nodes and blocks that we are providing with VFX graph because now they can create custom HLSL blocks to create their own system, for example blocks or custom simulations. But extending and optimizing requires uh, good tooling. We provide already a lot of tools, but we're introducing three um, more tools. The first one is a render graph view so that you can monitor the different render passes. Like the full uh, rendering framework is available now that you can see it in this tool. And you can monitor as well uh, the memory uh, and the frame resources usage. Then, uh, yeah, so basically this note, this one, I believe it's a brand new view because they've had the, the frame debugger for quite a while and that shows you all the steps that render the scene. And I believe this one is more organized by each render pass. So I believe it's like a, an upgrade on that one. So it should be really interesting how basically you can see each render pass, what it is doing, especially if you have custom render pass and you want to see how long that specific render pass is taking. So rather than just seeing the order, seeing how long. So in terms of optimizing for graphics, it should be quite useful. Uh, the shadow graph heat map and the VFX graph profiling tools allow to profile and optimize inside a shader or inside a VFX. On the visual fidelity side, um, we uh, one groundbreaking advancement is adaptive pro volumes or APVs. And it's a system uh, for global elimination that works across a wide range of platforms and scales very well. So it's a pro-based system, uh, of, like pre-baked in the editor with uh, automatic placement for fast iteration and uh, per vertex or per pixel lighting for great visual quality uh, and uh, and performance. This is definitely the, the number one feature that I'm looking forward to, adaptive for volumes. This is basically, uh, basically real-time global illumination, and it's a way... Technically, I think it's not real-time, technically, because you need uh, probes and you need to bake them, but I think you can make them real-time. I think so. I'm not 100% not sure. But basically, you can just... Again, take a box and automatically place all the probes so you don't have to manually place the probes. It bakes them all and everything gets some really gorgeous uh, global illumination. So this is definitely one of the main features that I'm definitely looking out for. It also supports large wells uh, with an integrated streaming system and uh, supports different lighting scenarios and sky occlusion you know, so that you can as well create a different time of the day or blend between them and having a continuous time of day. And both uh, adaptive pro volumes and the classical light maps now rely on a, a newly architectural light baker, which is lever leveraging the GPU while still uh, running on machines with only two gigabytes of uh, GPU memory so that you have better accessibility on light baking and while getting the performance. For the environment artists, when you want to create a uh, the high fidelity environment. Uh, most of, like most of the time, you need to have good sky and good water. So we introduced a new new water system in uh, HDRP in 2020s, and we are uh, wrapping up uh, the system with new features, uh, with currents, foam generator, deformers, excluders, as well as uh, better line rendering water light rendering, and it's all very easy to use uh, thanks to the samples in the package manager and the demos that we are providing as well. Uh, this one looks really awesome. I was waiting for, for him to say, and now it's also available on URP, but he didn't say that. So yeah, I think that that really awesome water system is still just for AGRP, which kind of sucks, but I get it because it looks really gorgeous. So yeah, I guess it must need some specific AGRP features. And for the sky? Uh, we wanted to add the support of time of day, as we mentioned already uh, for APVs. So we added night sky, we improved sunset and sunrise, adding ozone layer, 
and uh, improve the atmospheric, atmospheric scattering quality and performance by adding it directly into the sky system so that it works uh, at longer distance than other clouds as well. So then you need to populate this well, and often you need a lot of vegetation and variants uh, of this veg vegetation. Um, so we released it 39.5 last year with new tools, for example, the front sections, which allows to procedurally uh, generate variants of leaves, or with a cutout editor to better uh, process your, um, your texture atlases, uh, or the projectile system, which allows, for example, to project mushrooms, as we see on the image, or snow on top of your vegetation. And it's all uh, well integrated in NT6. There is a new importer, uh, which directly allows to load uh, the Speed 39 files and assets. And we improve as well performance, so you can have more vegetation at runtime, thanks to integrating Speed 3 into the GPU resident drawer that I was mentioning previously, and the integration of the Speed 39 game win system, which entirely runs on the GPU. So we are already working on Speed 3 then, which we'll be uh, releasing later this year, with again more tools uh, to create more organic options, such as advanced spine tools, uh, for example, or uh, more procedural workflows so that you can trim and shape your trees. And all this is coming uh, in uh, a new editor with a better UX and modernized UX uh, for Speed 3 10. So with this, uh, I... Speed 3 is always an amazing thing. Like I, I can't believe there's such a complex program just to make vegetation, but it makes sense because so many games have so many trees, but yeah, it's something that is really, really impressive the results that it makes, but yeah, something that in my case for making tiny indie games doesn't, doesn't really make much sense for my kind of work, but I'm always amazed to see all the kinds of things like uh, dragging something in order to cut the tree. So yeah. <laughs> it's always a fascinating tool. It's really awesome to see how so a tool for such a supposedly somewhat niche case but it's really insanely advanced, so yeah, really interesting. UX uh, for speed treatment. So with this, uh, I give the mic back to Andrew. Thanks, Matthew. Speaking of generating immersive worlds, we have to talk about the newest Unity product that launched last year, Unity Muse. Unity Muse is a suite of generative AI capabilities that allow you to generate original and copyright-free assets in editor, thanks to our custom-built, responsibly trained model. And as we continue to improve the underlying AI models, you'll start to see better quality sprite generation and more accurately stylized 2D images. And you may have already seen that we recently updated our Muse texture model to provide better output quality, state-of-the-art material generation, and more texture options. And something we're really excited about are the 3D texture improvements that are shipping later this year. Our AI yeah, all of these, uh, the main thing that I'm interested in is over there, improving sprites. Because the first time that I used Muse Sprite, which was, I don't know, like six months ago, so really early on, I was definitely not very impressed with the sprite tool, so I'm happy to see that they're focused on quality, while at the same time, like you mentioned, focus on not having issues with copyright, so they're maintaining that thing, so definitely happy to see that. And this one over here, the uh, Muse texture, this one has already improved quite significantly. They made a blog post a few, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, on talking about the improvements of Muse texture from like version 1.0, from like six months ago to now version 2.0 or something. And it did have some significant improvements. So I'm definitely hoping for those same improvements applied to Sprite, because usually Sprite, that's what makes more sense to me. And Texture 3D, I saw this one, but I'm not a 3D modeler, so I don't know specifically what this is. It does look impressive, like you give it a, a 3D model and basically generates and applies the texture exactly where it should be. So I'm not too sure, but if any of you are 3D modelers, I'm definitely curious to see just how useful this, uh, this little tool is, because it does seem, the results at least seem quite good. AI research team has pioneered a better way to create high resolution PBR textures from a prompt, an input geometry, or reference images. And with this technology, you can auto texture full 3D assets with multiple PBR materials in a meaningful and controllable way. And beyond generating art, we know that prototyping immersive worlds with AI needs more than just static imagery. To set up interactions, Muse Behavior allows you to build decision trees in Editor and provides AI to automatically generate the code needed to set up interaction behaviors. To make the most of these interactions and motions, Muse Animate allows you to turn text prompts into animations that can be applied to humanoid characters. We're also working on a new model for even more realistic actions and the ability to turn sketches and videos into character animations. 
say all three divisions do sound extremely interesting. I mean, the behavior one for me personally, I don't necessarily think so, but I think for a lot of people, especially less uh, program, personally, I like to make simple state animation, uh, state, uh, ah, state machines using code. So for me, not really all that, but uh, I do believe that one you can generate and then convert into C sharp code. So that might be interesting, but personally, the one that I'm really interested in is in Muse Animate. I mean, there are so many cases in which you want to make a quick prototype and it's, even if the asset store has tons and tons of animation, it takes a lot of time in order to browse those animations and find the specific one you want. So this one, in order to quickly generate uh, animations from text, this one I'm really looking forward to. And sound effects, this one looks really awesome. I mean, I think this is the first time they're they're announcing yet another texture to their, uh, yet another tool to their Muse tool stack. So yeah, generating sound effects. I'd be curious to see what are the results on this. Yeah. And lastly, we can't forget the audio. Coming later this year, Muse will allow for AI generated prompt to sound effects, such as movement and environmental sounds. On the topic of AI, let's get more advanced with Sentus. Sentus is our neural engine that unlocks new previously impossible features in Unity games because it enables you to run and import AI models. You can hook it up once and deploy to any runtime Unity supported platform, and we see it becoming an indispensable component of the engine. Just take a look at Plinio, a new and quirky game that uses advanced gesture detection powered by AI models running on Sentus to unlock really unique interactions. This deeper level of interaction creates a truly dynamic environment. So you By the way, Sentus, in case you don't know, this is their uh, tool for running uh, inference engines directly on device. So you don't need to uh, like contact, like with ChatGPT, you need to contact the open AI servers in order to make it work. Whereas this one does not need the internet or anything at all. So every time that I see Sentis, I'm always amazed to see the potential that it could have, but I'm still waiting to see some kind of killer app. This one does seem quite interesting, although very niche, being able to use machine learning in order to have gesture detection for finding all kinds of things. So yeah, it's uh, always interesting in this tool, but still waiting to see some kind of killer app. Deeper level of interaction creates a truly dynamic environment. So, you've created the world you're going to immerse your players in, but you need the actual gameplay too, and the user experience, and doing it all as efficiently as possible, including helping you and your team work better together. Productivity upgrades we've made across Unity 6 empower you to create faster and more efficiently, even with the additional functionality you'll see this week. And we hear that creating these kinds of deeply immersive and engaging games you strive for often needs the ability to work together in a streamlined manner. So I'd like to introduce Simon, who's gonna walk through some of the improvements we've made in this area. Absolutely. But before we get into the shiny new tools and workflows, we've also been working hard on the basics. We're delivering many ways to get started and work faster on game projects. On top of the new samples for URP that you've already heard about, we're adding new presets on what we call project-wide actions in the input system package, so that you don't have to keep setting up WSD again and again. We're also introducing new tools for the, to profile the job system better and to help you understand complex dependencies between many threads and jobs. Addressables are also getting better presets and platform defaults to save with repetitive setup tasks for asset bundles. Oh, okay. So all of these uh, project-wide input action, I have to say, whenever I do some kind of prototype, I still use the input manager just because it is so easy to use. You literally just write one line of code and it works. So yeah, this one making it much easier to get started with the input system. This could be a nice one. Maybe I'll start using that one even on prototypes. If it if it comes with a with a preset thing that is already already handled by default, that would be nice. And yeah, jobs profiling that is always nice because that one is always a little bit tricky. And dressables haven't used them for a while, but yeah, well. Great tiny things to help improve and platform pro defaults productivity. to save with repetitive setup tasks for asset bundles. And now for the real step change. AI offers great potential to assist you and your teams with basic tasks and use machine learning powered tools to get you to solutions faster. Chat, sprite, texture, behavior, and animate will all be available in edit to complement your existing workflows. Oh, right away. That, that is excellent news because it was always annoying, always very strange how Muse Chat, you had to go outside into an external website. So being able to have that in the editor, that is definitely really awesome. So right away, really great improvement. As Muse continues to improve and expand, you'll see these take on more in-editor tasks with deeper integration. One very exciting example of this is Muse Chat. With Chat moving in-editor, it is becoming more project-aware. 
This means that soon you'll start to see responses, solutions, and generated code that are directly tailored to your project. There's also a whole ecosystem. Okay, so that sounds really interesting. Putting uh, Muse Chat directly inside the editor and giving it information. I'm very curious to see how exactly this one works. So can I just say, okay, I'm trying to build a health system. Tell me how I would integrate on this complex project that is already built. So that sounds very interesting. I'm very curious to, to test out the limits of just how project aware it is, but right away, sounds really good. System of amazing AI solutions out there and for trusted solutions that you want to use in your project, access is going to be easier in the editor context via the Muse infrastructure. So we're helping bring helpful AI solutions closer to where you work today. With all this new content, you'll also need a better way to manage all these assets. Enter Unity Cloud. Unity Cloud centralizes content and streamlines workflows with connections between Unity Asset Manager, Unity Version Control, and the Unity Editor itself helping your team to create better games faster and with less of a headache. Unity Asset Manager provides a central asset repository for your studio to store, organize, discover, and deploy content directly into Unity projects. Unity Version Control provides source control that handles large 3D files without uh, any challenges of agility, uh, providing artists and developers with their own specific workflows to keep development moving. Unity Cloud connects all these tools to the Unity Editor, eliminating the time that's wasted currently switching between different applications, searching content, or trying to figure out who on earth has that texture via Slack or email. Oh, right away, those. So yeah, these are not really tools that I use myself since I'm really just a solo indie developer, so I really don't need these kinds of things, but it's really awesome for, for teams. But more specifically, I really like uh, what he said specifically, which is, the goal is to put all these tools directly inside the editor so you don't have to constantly alt tab between going into different tools. So even if I don't use this, I, I really like I really like that uh, that way that Unity is going of trying to integrate everything in the editor, making everything much more seamless. I quite like that. Content, or trying to figure out who on earth has that texture via Slack or email. As a preview of what's coming next in Unity Cloud, this year, we'll continue to roll out new features from Unity Asset Manager, such as versioning, custom asset statuses to help you with complex pipelines, bulk asset editing, and the ability to add comments and annotations. Also, a new feature that enables users to track asset dependencies directly on the dashboard, allowing you to improve your collaboration workflows. We'll also remain focused on developing deeper integrations with the Unity Editor and with Unity Version Control to make it easier for teams to work together across projects and pipelines. And rounding back on graphics, we've made it easier to create VFX and custom shaders to bring unique styles to your games. Many of you use Shader Graph and VFX Graph for multiple hours on a daily basis. We're improving the user experience with tons of keyboard shortcuts for both, better management of properties and keywords, and faster undo redo for Shader Graph, and improving attributes, Blackboard, and Node Search for VFX Graph. The new VFX Graph template system allows you to create a new effect faster and make it easier to share your own VFX library with the rest of your team. Oh, wow. I, I quite like that one about having various presets for VFX Graph. That sounds really awesome because there are so many times in which I'm making a brand new project for some kind of tutorial that I want to make, and I want to make some kind of explosions with particles, and I always have to rebuild that from scratch because I never have, I've never really prepared my own library, so having these templates, these sound really awesome. And all these improvements, again, tiny things that make you work quite a lot better. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of this section of the roadmap so far. Effect faster and make it easier to share your own VFX library with the rest of your team. We didn't just stop at quality of life either for VFX. Uh, or at smoothing the learning curve. We've also added new features that let UI artists use Shader Graph to create dynamic and responsive UI styles, and visual effects artists take full advantage of VFX Graph with the URP rendering pipeline. And to round out this chapter on more efficient tooling, let's look back at AI and talk about improvements we're making around Centis. Now, not everyone is an ML expert, so we're working to make Centis more accessible. In January, we launched an integration with Hugging Face, tagging models that we've, we've validated with Unity Centers and pre-converting them to the Centers format. You can import them directly into the editor and they just work. Of course, there are also C-sharp samples to go along with these. If you do want to tweak your models for performance or capabilities, or maybe you are an ML expert, 
we've got a graph tool to help make that more efficient as well. In-game models have to run fast, hitting 100 plus frame per rate targets, uh, even with relatively low GPU budgets. Chances are you might have used all the GPU for some of those fancy rendering features we showed you earlier. To speed up inference, we are supporting the new neural chipsets. If your end users have a neural processing unit on their device, then Centis will automatically take advantage of that extra compute. And last... Oh, that sounds quite interesting. So basically, I wonder how many devices are uh, have those kinds of neural chips? I don't think they're, they're quite that available just yet, but basically for the future, it sounds really interesting. And really awesome is over here, the Hugging Face integration with the Unity Synthesis Stack. That one sounds really awesome because I've... I've browsed Hugging Face, but I haven't really used it too much, so it, it all seems quite a bit uh, complicated. Machine learning is always very complex. So yeah, having something where I can just see, okay, this just works, just plug and play, download this model, make it work, that sounds like a really great improvement to make synthesis much easier to use. Lastly, we recently added quantization support, which converts huge model weights from high precision floating point 32-bit values down to much smaller int 8 values uh, and other variants in between. This can cut down memory usage and compute time sometimes as much as four times. You can kind of think of this as being a little bit like LOD, but for your ML. And with that, I'll hand it back to Andrew. Immersive worlds, check. Dynamic AI controlled entities, check. Streamlined workflows and great gameplay, check. The next step is to ensure your game lives on post-launch. And a critical factor in success is to drive deep player engagement. That includes making sure your game delivers on what player, players today expect. And it's no surprise that one thing you've asked for is a better multiplayer creation experience. Unity's fully end-to-end -end multiplayer solution has become even more robust over the last year. And with Unity 6, it's a powerful way of officially setting up a variety of multiplayer formats and features, including leaderboards, matchmaking, and more. Let's welcome Diana to tell us more. Hi, my name is Diana and I'm leading product for Unity Gaming Services. Unity has many solutions to help with a variety of multiplayer game needs. Uh, we're working on a series of templates to get you started, but we also understand you often have to navigate technical choices later in the game when it's time to introduce multiplayer concepts to your project. To help with this situation, we're working on a central location in the editor named Multiplayer Center where you can play with the parameters of your multiplayer goals and see what are the recommended tools, services, or educational materials relevant to your project at this point. You can add some of those directly to your project and start experimenting with those multiplayer capabilities immediately. Uh, this multiplayer player center, this one, something that they showed in the last Unite, and I was really impressed by it, and I'm still, uh, I still want to see how it's going to go because this seemed like something really awesome because sometimes multiplayer can be very... Uh, very intimidating because of how many tools, how many assets, how many packages you have to install. So having something in which pre-selects all the options, you just select the template and it automatically installs everything. I think that is really going to help uh, all kinds of people get started making multiplayer games. So I quite like that one. Once you have a working yeah. gameplay, the very next step is to try out multiple clients to get a feel of the experience using separated processes. This is what multiplayer play mode will deliver. It enables multiple editor instances of clients along with server to be open simultaneously on the same device using the same source code, uh, same assets on the disk, providing a more efficient and quick development cycle of multiplayer games. Yeah, this one is really awesome because when trying to make multiplayer games, having to constantly make a build, especially when it's a complex game, like when I was making my game, Think Gardens, near the end of development, making a build did take quite some time. So having this one where it just basically spawns a new Unity editor interface, this one, is really awesome. Definitely, once again, really speeds up iteration, which is extremely important, especially in multiplayer games. So I quite like this one. You can see it working here with our ca casual co-op boss rooms. And note how each one of them has a different console. That is really awesome for debugging. Sample. The next step for your team is usually to involve another play tester. In a casual co-op scenario, like we've seen in this slide before, that will often be in a client authoritative multiplayer gameplay coupled to your relay server. To accelerate your playtesting phase, we're integrating Unity Gaming Services Relay so you can simply create a session and get somebody else to join your play mode quickly. Your multiplayer game might require a... That was really awesome. I don't know if you noticed, there was a little, a little, basically just drawing, just putting the, uh, right there. So basically there's a new thing to add the really join code so you don't have to do some complex coding. You just 
right there, start the client, it automatically connects. Wow, that is really awesome. That really simplifies uh, making the really work. That's another great thing. Get somebody else to join your play mode quickly. Your multiplayer game might require a server authoritative model to prevent cheating, for example, when there is some competition involved. While you could use multiplayer play mode with any netcode stack, here is an example based on DOTS for an action competition game showcased through our latest competitive sample Mega City Metro. In such a scenario, multiplayer play mode will support the local and remote deployment of a dedicated server to keep the iteration loop as short as possible, even when you have a complex network topology. Oh, interesting. So basically you can uh, test dedicated servers locally. So basically it starts a dedicated server locally and creates the different, oh, that is good for testing. So you always, so you can basically always test on the uh, server architecture that you choose instead of having to constantly test with just local host versus only using dedicated servers when deploying. So yeah, another great improvement. We've delivered a dedicated server build target, allowing you to create both the client and the server from a single project, reducing significantly the development and iteration time. We're adding additional content selection features that will help you get one step further in that process without custom scripts and help you make that server as lean as possible with options to strip out the client parts of your project. Another really awesome thing, because yeah, when I implemented uh, multiplayer, when I worked with that, and also interesting how they're talking about multiplayer hosting. I thought they officially changed the name of that one, but anyways, uh, but yeah, having to press a button instead of having to go, once again, instead of having to go onto the dashboard and upload a separate bill, just being able to press a button and have all of that handled automatically in the background, another great thing that massively improves the interaction, iteration, yeah. But when you need to introduce a cloud infrastructure in your iteration loop for your dedicated server, it can become difficult and slow to iterate. This is why we have taken steps to automate the upload of your builds to a game server hosting solution in Unity Gaming Services, allowing to mix and match automatic creation of clients and server to run deployment scenarios faster and save you additional integration steps. All the multiplayer gameplay solutions coming to Un with Unity Engine are based on the transport package. This package provides a robust, low-level networking layer you can also leverage to build your own customized netcode for specific game needs. Yeah, by the way, in case you don't know, you if you don't want to use netcode for game objects, you can just use the Unity transport package if you don't want to deal with uh, manually handling connections, manually sending bytes, and so on. If you want to build anything on top of that, you can use just this one. So one thing, one project that I would like to try out is basically doing a non-game thing, just using this one, just sending bytes between, let's say, a mobile device and a computer in order to control things. So if you want to do simple things that... Remember how you don't need to use the entire, the entire tool stack. You don't need to use Netcode for game objects. You can just use the transport package, which should help uh, simplify basically just sending bytes back and forth. So this is quite interesting. Transport now supports Unity Bell, which means your solution could ship to all platforms. Of course, multiplayer play mode and dedicated server workflows can be used with your custom solutions as well. Building a multiplayer game today often requires to integrate several products and services together with thousands of lines of codes. With our upcoming multiplayer services SDK, we're massively simplifying integration and dependency management while offering a new way to interact with our services. Oh, that's another great one, because yeah, right now you basically need to uh, individually interact with each one of these services. So basically, I've got tutorials on each one of these individually because each one individually uses a different SDK. So yeah, having it all go through one single thing, that, once again, that really simplifies things, makes it easier to iterate upon, implement things. So yeah, another great improvement. And dependency. Although interesting to see how VVox is apparently separate from that one. I don't know why. Interesting. Management, while offering a new way to interact with their services. Building rich multiplayer experiences can sometimes feel daunting due to the complexity and high operational costs involved. But what if there was a way to distribute the simulation workflow across clients in a way that's scalable and resilient, reducing the burden on the server and opening up new possibilities for multiplayer development? That's exactly what our new network topology solution called Distributed Authority aims to achieve. By leveraging the familiar Unity Netcode solution, Netcode for game objects that you already know, and a new scalable cloud backend that we provide, distributed authority enables you to offload a significant portion of the computational workload from the server to the client and offers the flexibility to shift simulation between the two. With such a solution, you can build large-scale multiplayer titles with lower operational costs 
engineering effort and improved scalability to accommodate a larger number of concurrent players. Opening up. Yeah, this one is really interesting. So basically you can have, instead of having just a single host, you can have multiple uh, players and each of them is responsible, has authority over certain things. So over here, the red one is responsible for these red balls, the green one for this one. So that's that's an interesting one for, I guess it helps for the, yeah, like it says here, distributed uh, simulation workloads. So basically if you have lots of, especially with lots of physics objects, then yeah, I guess this one would be interesting. You have each player handles just a handful of objects, making the whole thing run much better, as opposed to having all of that stress on the on the host. So yeah, it's a, an interesting one. Instead of having just one host, then you got distributed authority and of course dedicated service. So three interesting different modes. ...up new possibilities for multiplayer development. In the world of multiplayer games, maintaining fair competition is crucial to keep players engaged. However, you often face difficulties when it comes to establishing a skill system of your own. Our skill-based matchmaker will eliminate the need for you to build a skill system from scratch. Through this feature, you can effortlessly compute player skill scores using various metrics, such as wins, loadout, or in-game achievements. The skill-based matchmaker can be easily configured to suit the specific requirements of each game, ensuring a level playing field for all players, which fosters a genuinely fair competitive environment that boosts player retention and engagement. You also want to have better observability to track things that are happening to the matches created by the matchmaker so that you can see trends or catch issues earlier for debugging. Session Details offers enhanced observability into the matchmaker by providing you with match level details. It can track major events that occur throughout the lifespan of each match, such as the specific matchmaking rules that have been applied to a match, the joining sequence of individual players, and backfill updates. With match level observability, you can identify trends, detect and resolve issues faster, reducing time to iterate the matchmaking system. Just as we carefully curate matches to enhance player engagement, our safety solution are tailored to safeguard our players, making every game not just competitive, but also a secure and welcoming space for everyone involved. Our approach centers on utilizing intelligent AI-based detection systems for efficient monitoring of your voice and text chat promoting positive behavior to cultivate respect and camaraderie and take actions to address identified toxic behaviors. Oh, it's interesting how she mentioned both voice and text chat. I thought this one only worked with voice. So yeah, this could be interesting, especially for indie game developers who can't really afford to have a massive moderation team. Yeah, I think these tools can be quite interesting. So basically making multiplayer games easier and then having this one in order to be able to more easily handle multiplayer games. So yeah, if you're a small team trying to handle that, then hopefully this should be quite a useful tool. Safe Voice fuses semantic and acoustic analysis for sharper insights, limiting the need for human moderators to review the evidence. This year, we will roll out rule-based moderation actions, which will increase the productivity and morale of moderation teams even more. We're also excited that we will be launching our innovative Safe Text platform, featuring an adaptive chat filter that actively screens and filters toxic content in real time. Complementing this, our advanced context analysis technology delves into the entirety of conversations, enhancing the detection of toxic content by understanding the context. With integrated evidence from Safe Voice and Safe Text, you can quickly organize and prioritize incidents based on overall risk, toxicity, and disruption scores, and really scale your moderation workflows. You can not only take actions, but also get an overview of moderation activity and player behavior in your game track sanctions, and assess moderation efficiency using an intuitive dashboard. Together, Safe Voice, Safe Text, and Moderation fortify our platform safety suite, allowing you to build communities that are safer by design, game after game. If you want to get a head start on multiplayer, make sure you don't miss our Mega City Metro sample talk. And with that, back to you, Andrew. Of course. Yeah, by the way, there's the, a new Mega City sample. I wonder if it's downloadable or if it's only visible at GDC, but yeah, I think they, they did announce it. They did publish it. So yeah, basically there's a new Mega City Metro. So it uses, uh, it's a multiplayer game, like one with ships flying around. So if you've seen the last Unite, that one should be, I believe it is downloadable right now. I don't know. I'll have to see afterwards, but yeah, that one should be using all these tools. So it should be an interesting case study. Of course, building an immersive and engaging title is critical to the successful reception of your game but you're also concerned with making sure you're delivering your game where your players are and where they want to play. Unity's industry-leading platform support allows you to build for web, 
mobile, PC, and XR, including some of the hottest new devices. Let's welcome Tara to tell us more. Hey everyone, my name is Tara and I'm on the product team here at Unity. Let's cover new features that will help you reach more players across platforms. In Unity 6, we're rolling out improvements to make your life easier when it comes to setting up your builds and exploring new platforms. We've heard from many of you about the challenges of using custom scripts to manage builds because our settings are too rigid and only configurable at the project level. We've taken your feedback to heart and are excited to announce the introduction of build profiles, which give you the flexibility to create multiple profiles for a target platform. For each phase of your project, whether it's a vertical slice, a demo, or the final version, you can set custom settings and scene lists for each profile. And this one is a, a really awesome thing that I know people have wanted for a very long time. So it's really awesome to see them finally going. So basically, instead of having to make all kinds of custom scripts in order to make a build for Android, then a build for Steam, then a build for the Epic Game Store, then another one for Humble and so on, instead of having to do all that, you can just create profiles, easily swap between them. So yeah, I think these, <laughs> these are, it's something that uh, people have wanted for a very long time. So it's really awesome that it's finally officially supported. This one is really going to be quite helpful to a lot of people. And that's not all. We're also making it easier to discover the platforms that Unity supports through the new platform browser. This isn't just a list. It's your new shortcut to get everything set up with the right packages and the right settings for your target platform automatically. Getting your games onto the web presents a huge opportunity for you to reach a larger audience of players. Starting with Unity 6, you'll be able to run your Unity games anywhere the web exists, including mobile browsers. You'll be able to run your Unity titles embedded in a web view inside a native app or use our progressive web app template to make your games behave like native apps along with their own shortcuts. And through our strategic partnership with Google, Web GPU is now available in Unity 6 beta. With this early access to the Web GPU backend, you can now experiment with things like compute shaders, GPU skidding, VFX graph, and more GPU-driven rendering techniques. The WebGPU is really interesting, but the last time that I researched, I saw that it was in, uh, basically in the various browsers, it is still in the experimental stage. So this one seems, it seems something really awesome, but definitely something way out in the future, I believe. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in web, but yeah, it does seem something really awesome. I mean, being able to use uh, uh, compute shaders to do all kinds of awesome stuff directly on a browser, that definitely sounds excellent. And mobile web support is something that when they announced back at, back at Unite, there was huge cheer. So I'm not too familiar with the, with the uh, web market, especially mobile web, but apparently that's a huge deal. So nice to see this, yeah. We've also partnered with Meta to build support for their instant games platform. Through Facebook and Messenger, you'll have the opportunity to reach hundreds of millions of players they're discovering games every day. With Unity 6, you'll be able to easily build and publish web-based games to this platform and greatly expand your reach. Next, let's review some exciting news from our partnership with Microsoft. In Unity 6, we're adding native Unity editor support for ARM-based Windows devices. This means you can work on your Unity games on even more Windows devices taking advantage of the performance and flexibility that ARM-powered devices can offer. You'll also be able to develop Win32 games using Microsoft Game Development Kit, which contains the common tools to build Windows standalone games. We know how- Arm That's an interesting one. How many, how many devices nowadays have ARM in them? I don't think Windows on ARM is still very popular, but hey, I'm, anything that gets the editor <laughs> available in more places is always a, a uh, great thing to see. How important it is that not only do your games install quickly, but they're also performant across many different types of Android devices. To help with this, Unity 6 supports Play Asset Delivery through the new Addressables Android package. With this feature, you'll benefit from dynamic delivery options, and when you combine this with texture compression target formatting, your players will get textures customized for their devices while still maintaining an overall smaller install size. Unity will also include a new application point, Game Activity, powered by the Android Game Development Kit. This system brings a number of new benefits, including improved threading and enhanced updatability through the use of Android X. We've made some major improvements to iteration speeds while you're developing for console platforms. 
Unity's incremental build pipeline allows you to iterate more quickly in between builds. Once a scene has been built, subsequent builds will focus only on the delta, meaning build times drastically reduced in most situations. As you can see on screen, when we tested the boat attack project, after doing a script change, build times dropped by almost 50% in Unity 6 versus the 2021 LTS. After doing a script change, build times dropped almost 50% in Unity 6 versus the 2021 LTS. And building a scene without any changes dropped from 40 seconds to just over five. Yeah, this one is uh, something that they've had for quite a while. I'm pretty sure this was available in the 22 LTS. And yeah, this one is definitely really awesome, really massive, massive improvements. Back when I was making my my uh, multiplayer free course, the Kitchen Chaos course, back when I was making that one, since I had to constantly make builds, this one really helped. Without this one, it would take like minutes to make a build. But with this one, it took a few seconds. And yeah, when, when making builds for consoles, this is one of the things that you definitely want to be super nice and snappy. That's a huge improvement that will offer significant benefits to your iteration speeds during development. Lastly, let's dive into new capabilities for XR platforms. While we have a ton of new features coming in Unity 6 for XR development, let's highlight a few of these key features you can use while developing for platforms like MetaQuest and Vision OS. Whether you wanna expand your existing game with mixed reality, or you're making something entirely new, Aero Foundation empowers you to incorporate the physical world into the player's experience in a cross-platform way. And in Unity 6, we're expanding meshing, occlusion, bounding boxes, and persistent anchors to additional platforms like MetaQuest, Vision OS, and Android. We're also adding Vulkan support in AR Core and enhancing it for MetaQuest, so your players have smoother, more performant visuals. One feature we're super excited about is composition layers, another way to improve the visual fidelity of your game. Here we have a side-by-side -side comparison. On one side, a regular texture, and on the other, a composition layer. As you can see, the use of composition layers significantly reduces artifacts, giving us clearer text, sharper outlines, and overall a better appearance. We've also created interactive UI components for composition layers allowing you to get started with minimal setup or easily convert your existing UI. We know that setting up multiplayer for your VR games is difficult. So we're trying to make this easier through our new multiplayer VR template built on top of OpenXR. This template is a first class showcase of Unity's breadth of multiplayer services, allowing you to get straight to building content with spatialized voice chat lobbies, networked interactions, and hand tracking. Finally, a feature I know many of you are excited about. For those developing for Vision OS, Play to Device is a game-changing feature that leverages Unity's polyspatial technology to stream your app's content over the local network, enabling you to iterate and preview your content across the Unity Editor, the Vision OS Simulator, or Apple Vision Pro. Wow, that is really awesome. <laughs> Just looking at that little scene makes me think how this would be quite a, a fun tool for doing some kind of level design, like being able to physically move the <laughs> the level parts around. That could be a, a really fun use case. Yeah, the Vision OS, uh, <laughs> quite nice. Any tweaks that you make in the Unity editor, like adding game objects, adjusting inspector values, or refining shader graphs, instantly sync to your simulator or device in real time. And what's even cooler, if you use this new feature while wearing a Vision Pro, you can work in the editor using Mac virtual right. display and see your spatial content right next to it. This is an incredible new way to work while developing your games for Vision OS. Thank you all for listening to our exciting updates on Unity platforms. So with all Yeah, that all sounds really interesting. Honestly, when I first started about the uh, Vision Pro, I didn't really have much interest in it, especially given how, how expensive it is. But the more I see it, the more, <laughs> the more I get interested in wanting to try it out and make some uh, fun, interesting prototypes with it. But yeah, it's still really expensive. So yeah, still <laughs> not quite sure. And actually over here in Portugal, I still can't even buy it even if I, even if I wanted to pay for it. So yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, definitely one day I definitely would like to can apply for a dev kit. Oh, that would be nice if I, if I could, because yeah, that would be definitely got, uh, Especially seeing this, oh, that looks quite interesting for making all kinds of level design. So yeah, 
it's nice how how as the device matures hopefully the use case become a bit more more evident becomes a bit easier to figure out what the device can do all the possibilities in front of you and the rich diversity of ideas you want to bring to life it is important unity gives you the room you need to explore and grow your ambitions along with your game success we're already hard at work modernizing the foundations of the engine I want to unveil more details about the, our progress there. Please welcome Laurent to walk you through some of the key aspects of our plan. Hi, I'm Noam Kibot, Product Manager at Unity. Before we look at some of our targets for the future, it would be useful to quickly revisit the new foundational capabilities that landed in a Unity engine over the last 12 months. I'm talking in particular about ECS, Entity Component System, a core framework about data-oriented technology stack, DOTS. Starting with Unity 2022 RTS, ECS is fully integrated into the editor and supported for production on all platforms. An ECS architecture helps design more flexible game code architecture. This allows games like Eroish to pivot their game ideas more easily during production, reducing refactoring risks. ECS also gives you complete control of your target device hardware. This is how a title like Detonation Racing could deliver such an intense gameplay on the target device. ECS efficient memory layout and scalable processing enable the simulation of many more enemies with complex physical gameplay, like in Hostile Mars. The many hundreds of thousands of dynamic objects of the V Rising open world are being brought to life based on the ECS for Unity stack. And finally, ECS for Unity powers a new range of multiplayer gameplay possibilities thanks to its netcode stack and determinism. If you want to see a fully functional demonstration of this, please check out Megacity Metro, a scalable, High concurrency cross platform sample of our end to end multiplayer platforms that we play tested with more than 100 players. We are committed to the DART ecosystem as demonstrated yeah. <laughs> right away. I really like that line because, yeah, anytime I mention DOTS, there's always one, one comment who goes, Well, DOTS is nice, but Unity is going to abandon it a while. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really happy to see that every time they mention some kind of thing, they mention how they're committed for the, for the long term. So, you are safe to use it. And, yep, they've already put out quite a lot of impressive updates, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. So yeah, they're constantly, this is definitely not something that they've been building on and they're not, uh, and they're not going to drop. Nope, this is definitely something that they are committed to going for the uh, long-term future. So yeah, I personally, as someone who's a, a really big fan of DOTS and I really want to see the future where pretty much the engine behind it uses DOTS, meaning that if you yourself still just use game objects, you still get the benefits from all this DOTS stuff because the background is all using DOTS, so it's all super performance. So yeah. Personally, when it comes to DOTS, I think it's already awesome right now, and I'm really excited to see everything that's going to come into future. ...by the mini minor versions of ECS for Unity currently being worked out. ECS 1.1 and 1.2 are already available in the package manager, and we're preparing version 1.3. We've been listening to your immediate feedback from your production environments and prepared many different fixes and improvements that will be delivered back where you work on Unity 2022 RTS and Unity 6 at launch. In a recent survey, 25% of you told us you could use ECS as a solution in production. However, you also told us that ECS can represent a significant learning curve, resulting in a little less than 10% being able to actually implement it in production. This is short of our goal, which is to deliver data-oriented performance to every single one of your projects. This is why we've been at work bringing game objects and entities closer together in a future version of Unity after Unity 6. By doing so, we'll make ECS power available to you in the context of the editor to leverage its runtime power for authoring workflows. This would also make it easier for you to introduce a targeted ECS solution to your game object-based projects to tackle a, a specific performance bottleneck. And finally, this will help us deliver more performance to all of you, in many cases without having to expose the ECS complexity if you don't need it. So yeah, basically that's what I was saying. That's their that's their goal. I've spoken to Laura a few times, and he has mentioned how that is the goal. How basically the Unity backend they're going to uh, be using more and more dots on that. So even if you yourself don't use any dots at all, if you don't touch ECS directly, you are still going to benefit from all those all those benefits. Okay, yeah, it was interesting because yeah, <laughs> like the number said, 100% of people do want performance improvements. So <laughs> everyone always wants more performance. So if the engine by itself, just without you having to do anything specifically. If just by itself, the engine already performs better, that is uh, really awesome, regardless of what you're trying to use. So yeah, like I said, <laughs> really excited for the future of DOTS. The first milestone of this convergence is to ensure that for every game object of your project, 
there is an equivalent entity linked to it. Oh. It simplifies manipulating your project data through both environments. The most important data you usually need to synchronize between game object and ECS are object transformations. This is why we are aligning both transformation APIs and data structure to boost synchronization performance. This will lead us to unify the scene and build workflows to ensure that regardless of the system you use for manipulating your project data, we provide a fully unified experience. As I mentioned a little bit earlier... Wow, that was quite a lot of information. Oh, okay, interesting. So basically, this, this is all for the future, so this is all beyond Unity 6, so definitely not something that is going to happen this year. Very interesting. Game objects are also entity. So are they going to make so that by default, every single game object you create has an entity attached to it. And this really screenshot over here seems really interesting. So basically you've got the built-in components, so the regular transform rigid body. Then you've got some custom behavior components, so regular uh, mono behaviors. And then apparently on that one, you can also add some component data. So that is really interesting. So being able to have basically put all together and somehow magically it all works, both ECS and game object. Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> I imagine this is a very significant engineering challenge, but yeah, I, I, I quite like the ambition. It does sound, <laughs> it does sound like the future is going to be very difficult for Unity, but very interesting, potentially very powerful. That regardless of the system you use for manipulating your project data, we provide a fully unified experience. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, converging game object and ECS will have amazing applications for scalable project authoring workflows. To illustrate this, we have been working on a major rework of our engine animation system that will be based on ECS. The additional performance rule allows us to deliver more complex and dynamic workflows to you in the editor, as well as giving you the ability to have many more characters on screen at an unprecedented level of complexity at runtime. Yeah, again, so this is the kind of thing. If they themselves improve the animation on the back end to be able to use dots, you yourself can keep using the regular animation tools and basically everything will just run faster. So yeah, this is exactly what I want to see. We've also been out our work to reimagine our world building workflows based on ECS again. This work will bring us closer to large open world support out of the box in Unity. We'll share more about those developments in the future. Yeah, so when it comes to world building, also interesting because yeah, the uh, Unity terrain is something that I have not used personally way too much. I usually don't use uh, complex terrains in my games, but I've heard a lot of people have <laughs> a lot of gripes with it. So yeah, being able to have that be a lot more efficient, a lot more performant, and a lot more capable with a lot more features, that sounds great. Speaking of delivering additional performance oh, nice. to 100% of Unity project, I'm glad to inform you that we're making significant progress with our migration to Core CLR. This is another step in modernizing the core foundations of the Unity engine. The world of .NET is changing rapidly, and performance enhancements are coming with every new version of Friends of Microsoft release. With our work on integrating Core CLR to Unity, we'll bring additional raw speed to the editor simpler IDE build integration, and faster code reload. This will result in major improvements to iteration time. On the other hand, new optimization and garbage collection will dramatically improve the runtime performance. The other signs are pretty good. Some parts of the Unity editors and tests we made with UI Toolkit are running twice as fast. Wow. We are excited to deliver. OK, so yeah, that is definitely, again, keep in mind, this is all for beyond Unity 6, so definitely not going to happen this year, this is something uh, for next year and beyond. But yeah, all of these sound really good improvements. I still haven't researched the course in too much, so I'm not I'm not too sure on the specifics, but from what I know, it's just objectively a great improvement. So yeah, I mean, iteration time, uh, <laughs> that's one thing that a lot of people are constantly complaining about, how it takes way too long to just change one thing and recompile it takes way too long. So anything that improves that, that's really awesome. And of course, yeah, better runtime performance and feature proofing. This is actually, this is actually something that Unity has done quite well uh, recently. Whereas previously, uh, Unity used to be in like, I don't know, four or five uh, C-sharp versions behind. Whereas lately, it's been uh, pretty good. And I imagine once they move on to the core CLR, staying up to date with all the C-sharp versions, that should be even faster. So yeah. Garbage collection will dramatically improve the runtime performance. The other signs are pretty good. Some parts of the Unity editors and tests we made with UI Toolkit are running twice as fast. We are excited to deliver all of those performance improvements in future releases of Unity so that you're able to build more ambitious games regardless of your expertise. Well, there you have it. The bulk of what you saw over this past hour is coming to you soon in Unity 6. Unity 6 Preview is, will be released in May with full production support until Unity 6 is released later this year. We looked at new tools and new services that, coupled with the improvements and upgrades you've made to the engine overall, 
go really some way to addressing the most common requests and scenarios you tell us you faced frequently. We're pretty proud of what we're delivering in the next major release of Unity, and we can't wait to see what you can create with it. Thank you for joining us. All right, so yeah, personally, I think that was that was really great. A lot of things coming in the future and even more beyond. So yeah, in general, yeah, I'm uh, quite a big fan of of the roadmap started off quite interesting lots of uh, rendering improvements so yeah that one is only something that is like i said i'm not a graphics program so anything in which i can just tick a box and everything runs faster oh and by the way you can go ahead and download the urp samples to the uh, happy harvest so yeah the uh, the things that make the code run much faster yeah this one definitely looking forward to that just take a box and everything runs faster so yeah that one is really good then all the improvements about rendering and all kinds of stuff. So if you if you are more of an artist, if you do all kinds of things, then these improvements are definitely going to be very useful. And the one about uh, water, <laughs> it just sucks how this one is apparently still just AGRP only, but still, if you are using AGRP, then this water system doesn't look really awesome, really excellent. And so many things about Speedtree, Muse AI also seems to continue to improve. So that's great to see. As long as that one continues, it's going to be great. And Muse Animate, this one is the one that personally I'm most interested in, being able to quickly generate some prototype animations in order to make some prototype work much better. So this sounds really good. Same thing for sound effects. If this one works, I, I, I'm very curious to try this out and see how good it is because I don't know. I imagine that making sound effects is actually more complex than making sprites. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how many different sounds this can make, but yeah. Basically, when it comes to uh, Muse and all their AI tools, I think these are really excellent for quickly building all kinds of prototypes. So you've got some kind of idea and very quickly you can generate assets, animation, sound effects, uh, behavior trees, make the level, make everything. So yeah, for the prototyping stage, I think these tools are extremely helpful. And yeah, all of the day-to-day uh, -day improvements, these are all really excellent, like really tiny things that massively improve uh, your speed of iteration of working with the editor. So these were really good. And yeah, more and more things about asset management and all kinds of things. More improvements with Shader Graph and the multiplayer center. This one is definitely something that I'm very much looking forward to. So this one says coming in Unity 6. So this one is coming. So basically you've got a window where you can select some kind of template and basically automatically automatically pre-selects all of the things to install and automatically installs all of the packages. So this one should, once again, should really help simplify the process for starting off a brand new multiplayer game prototype. So that one's really awesome. Multiplayer play mode, so you don't have to constantly make brand new builds every time. So that really speeds up. The relay being much easier to integrate. That one is also another really awesome thing. Same thing for dedicated server, just pressing a button instead of having to go into an external thing to make a separate build and upload. So that's really good. The multiplayer SDK, basically uh, unifying all the different multiplayer tools into one thing that you can very easily access. That's another great thing for ease of use. Distributed authority, so this is one is also going to be really interesting for making different kinds of games that can handle much better. Safe voice, again, if, you're, if you've got some kind of multiplayer game, being able to safely handle that community, especially if you are a small indie developer who, who can't really afford an entire dedicated team for moderation, these tools can be extremely useful. And yeah, build profiles, this one is really awesome. This one is something that a lot of people have wanted for a very long time, so it's really awesome to see that coming in. Mobile web support, again, this one is apparently a super huge deal, so it's really nice to see. And WebGPU as well, being able to use com uh, compute shaders directly on the browser. That seems like a really awesome upgrade. And yeah, even more performance improvements, just improving all kinds of things. All of the AR stuff, I have to say, I still haven't, <laughs> I've wanted to, to play around with AR and VR for a very long time, but I still haven't gotten around to it, so. Yeah, all of these things sound really interesting, but I don't have much experience. I definitely definitely would like to try it out at some point because all of these improvements with the uh, occlusion, that one, as far as I know, used to be a really complex problem. But over here on this demo, it seems like it was working quite well. I mean, those those balls are being stuck behind that wall and so on. Improving visual, visual fidelity with text specifically. This one is also really awesome. Every time I've played a VR game, every time you have to read some kind of tutorial, it's always really messed up. So these improvements seem really good. Social experience, this one, again, something to very quickly speed up. And this one, this one uh, seemed really awesome to me. I mean, <laughs> being able to do level design by physically handling things inside your Apple Vision Pro, visually moving things around in order to <laughs> create your own level, this makes it really awesome. Honestly, it makes me, like I played, uh, I spent most of my childhood playing Counter-Strike. So right away, looking at this one, especially like this where it looks some kind of desert, it makes me imagine, oh, it would be really awesome to have like 
uh, the map does too right here next to me so I can play around with moving all the crates. That, <laughs> I think that would be really awesome. So yeah, lots of improvements there. And everything with dots is already awesome and continues being really awesome. And for the future, so many things coming in, bringing game objects and entities closer together. That one sounds really, really ambitious, really exciting. So I'm definitely very curious to see how that one is going to go. Dots animation, really awesome. World building as well. So yeah, when it comes to the future and course CLR, just making everything snappier and faster, that one seems really good. So yeah, I mean, all in all, I have to say I'm quite quite pleased with this with this little uh, roadmap. So yeah, I'm curious to see what are you all thinking? Because yeah, I have to say I was I was focusing way too much on on watching, so I didn't really read too many comments. So I'm curious to see what is the sentiment. What do all of you all of you feel? And yeah, it seems like the Unity 6 beta is out now. I thought the preview was out, but no, that, that's the thing that's a little bit confusing. So previously, you used to have the beta, then the tech stack, and then the LTS, whereas now you've got beta, then preview, and then the final version. So right now, apparently Unity 6, the beta is out right now. Well, actually, I can just open it up and try to see. But yeah, apparently, if I go into installs, install the editor, Okay, so okay, so it's on pre-release. So basically, it's the Unity 6, which is <laughs> 6,000, which is kind of fun. Yeah, so apparently that one is in beta. Then apparently in something uh, around March, Mar no, May, I think that's what they said. So around May, it's going to go into preview, which is basically going to be the equivalent of previously what used to be the uh, uh, beta version. Oh, God, it's so, <laughs> so confusing. But yeah, after I figure out, I guess it's going to be easy. But basically, yeah, so the preview, and then comes the... Unity 6 proper, which is going to be the equivalent of an LTS version. So yeah, so yeah, that one is uh, quite interesting. Okay, let me read some comments. Does this mean we will have C Sharp 12? I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure what what specific version of C Sharp is currently going on. So yeah, same thing about Vision Pro is just imagine how this tech will evolve in the coming years. Yep, I, I definitely, I agree. I mean, uh, the... The Vision Pro and this little push for AR, since uh, since uh, Apple is now coming in, they're really putting in a ton of money into it. I think that is going to be, I think that is definitely just the beginning. So I'm very curious to see how that one going to go. I think change the approach of the multiplayer tutorial. Are you talking about the distributed networking? No, that is basically just a different one. So you can now just host, just one one person host, or it can have a dedicated server, or it can have distributed authority, which basically each player holds uh, authority over different parts of the map. So basically it allows you to make bigger, more complex games. And I think that also means that players don't have to be on the same place at all time. I don't know, I'll have to try that out. So basically you could have different games with all kinds of things, so yeah. T6 coming out, we'll check to see if it was worth updating the Garden Suit. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that would be definitely an interesting thing, depending on the improvements, especially especially if I can just take a box and the game runs 50% faster in terms of rendering. Yeah, I, I guess that, that would be awesome. So we shall see uh, what happens in the in the future. Yeah, I'm still scared to touch CCS and film coding things. <laughs> but yeah, that's what uh, what I was saying, which is basically the goal is to get to the point where you yourself don't have to specifically touch ECS. If you're just using Unity, Unity in the background is going to be using ECS and dots in order to make everything much faster. So even if you yourself just use plain old game objects, everything should still hopefully be quite a bit faster. So yeah, hopefully that should be, even if you are concerned about ECS, you should still benefit from quite a lot of these things. What about the runtime fee? I made a video on the updated things. So basically uh, in most cases, just don't worry about it because not going. if you are an in-dev like me, then yeah, you're not going to. and uh, I don't remember the big takeaway, but yeah, I made a, I made a video on that. So if you want to see, uh, ah, crap, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so essentially that thing, technically the fee still exists on Unity 6, so only on that version afterwards. But yeah, it's all based on you telling Unity how many copies you sold, and it's based on that. It's not based on insults or anything like that. So basically the math is the fee ends up being, if you have to pay, it's at most 2.5%. So personally, I don't think that's going to be an issue. At least personally for me, as a solo indie game developer, I'm never going to hit the limits of selling over $1 million and 1 million copies. I'm never going to hit those numbers. So personally, that is something that I don't really worry about. So if you are an indie dev like me, then yep, also. Yeah, exactly. If anything, you can just do 2.5% revenue. So yeah, if you are concerned about the runtime fee, you can just do the math with that. And it's always guaranteed going to be less than that. So yeah, 
And yeah, the splash screen, yeah, another thing that they actually didn't mention, they, they should have mentioned because it's something that a lot of people have been looking for. Basically, starting with Unity 6, if you're using the completely free version, you no longer have to use the Unity splash screen. So I know a lot of people really <laughs> dislike that. So yeah, starting on Unity 6, yep, you can just remove the splash screen if you want and should be like that. And yeah, they also put out this roadmap. Let's see if this has a little bit more information. Oh, it actually has the... Uh, Unity 2024's, oh crap, I moved, uh, the report, which is actually quite, uh, let me get the, yeah, if you want to download the, the report, there it is, because this one is actually, it's a, the Unity Gaming Report, yeah, I'm planning to make a video on this, basically this has a mountain of, oh crap, because right now I've got to access, basically it has a, a ton of information, all kinds of things. So yeah, definitely check out that link and definitely check out that report because it has a ton of stuff. It's really a giant page with tons of information. And yeah, it has all kinds of things from single player games, multiplayer games, games made with studios, with uh, with uh, small teams. Uh, what are the current challenges? What are the best ways to solve those challenges and so on? So yeah, I definitely encourage you to go and check out the uh, gaming report. Like I said, I'll be making a video on that covering the core things. Uh, and yeah, the road ahead for Unity 6. And that is indeed uh, this video, really nice. And it was actually relatively short, but nice and compact. <laughs> Real nice and solid, 45 minutes of just excellent information. That was good, that was nice. Oh yeah, and the Mega City Metro sample, apparently you can download this right now. So yep, you can download the Mega City Metro. So this is an end-to-end -end multiplayer demo. I believe it is using, yep, it is using Netcore for entities because it supports 128 players cross-platform. So it's all really awesome. And it's, uh, it's even uh, playable. Okay, so this is the old one, yeah. So basically, the, yeah. Yeah, basically there was the Mega City demo, which is kind of funny how it was the very first demo that they showcased when they first talked about DOTS in, I don't know, like 2016, 2017. So, so many years ago, they first announced uh, the original Mega City demo. So it's really awesome how right now, what is it, like five, six, seven years later, now finally this demo is now downloadable, works perfectly, single player, multiplayer. So yeah, definitely. If you want to see how it all works, definitely download the sample and give it a try. Because, yeah, it is something that seems very impressive. Basically, it's got large-scale streaming and rendering with ECS. That's awesome. Interpolation, prediction, like compensation. That is something that a lot of people have asked. How do you do that? Well, you can just look at this process, at this project. Max out performance with 128 players on mobile. That is really awesome. And on desktop, enabled by DOTS and URP. That's awesome. And it's using all of these, all of these servers. So it uses a uh, dedicated servers. It's got Matchmaker and Vivox, so you can chat around. So yeah, this demo seems definitely really complex. I definitely would like to try it out for a little bit to spend some time inspecting it because that definitely seems quite impressive. So yep, if you want, you can go ahead and download it. Streamline workflows for Unity Cloud. Like I said, since I'm a, a Solo game developer, usually these kinds of tools aren't really all that useful to me, but if you work as a team, from, from what I can see, these tools do seem uh, extremely useful for working with teams and collaborating, or even if you just do uh, a couple of game jams every now and then, these do seem quite useful for that. And Muse Preview for Texture 3D. Yeah, like I was saying when we were watching the roadmap, I'm not I'm not a, a 3D modeler myself, so I don't specifically know exactly what what this one is meant to. What is the challenge that this one is solving? I'm not a hundred percent sure how. Basically, you give it a 3D model and generates a texture that adapts perfectly to that model. I'm not entirely sure, but it does seem extremely impressive. So, yep, it's really nice how Unity Muse is iterating upon itself and becoming better and better. That's another thing that I'm very curious to see how it's going to go along in the future. Capture daily rewards in Google AdMob for mobile. Okay, so I'm not into the mobile market, so I have no idea what this means. But if you are, hopefully this is something nice. And celebrating the Unity community. Again, it's always really awesome to see all of these really awesome games. And again, how they're all really so different. So there's one top-down action game. Then you've got something really stylized, really awesome. Another thing, really stylized, really awesome. Oh, and this one that looks really awesome. No rest for the wicked. Just in case you don't know, this is actually... Apparently it's a new game by the <laughs> developers that made Ori. And it's kind of like an action game, very strange. <laughs> so it's kind of funny how they went from uh, Ori, which was a really jolly, really nice, <laughs> really nice looking game to making something really dark. And yeah, and this one looks really awesome. Some kind of thing with zombies, something else with some really gorgeous 2D art and Lego builders. And yeah, they show in AR. That is also really awesome. 
And yeah, Southfield. I'm not familiar with this one, but nice building, multiplayer. And another one with a really interesting art style. That is really interesting. Arcade Paradise. So yeah, as you can see, tons and tons of... Oh, look at that. All of those games are inside an arcade. That was fun. Hey, Falconeer Chronicles. Yeah, I really enjoyed playing the original Falconeer, so that one looks really good. And something with tons and tons of characters. And something with some really awesome mechs. Wow, that looks really cool. Ooh, nice. Ooh, that looks nice. <laughs> and this one, for some reason, apparently you play a character who has an angry foot. I'm pretty sure I saw some gifs of this, like, one year ago, two years ago on Twitter, something like that. <laughs> but, yeah, basically looking at these sizzle reels, it's always really awesome to see the variety and the, the awesomeness of all these games shown here. So, <laughs> it's always really awesome, yeah. Yeah, Thomas Allen, Bulwark, Falconeer, Chronicles. Yeah, that one, I definitely want to give that a shot because that seems quite interesting. So, yeah, so many things, all really impressive, yeah. Thank for the conversation and memories. As we close out GDC, we want to thank everyone who took time to connect with us live and in person. Ah, uh, that's really awesome. I wish I could have gone, but yeah, this year I wasn't able to go to GDC. It's, uh, I'm sure it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, are any of you at GDC? <laughs> I'd be curious to know. So yeah, it should be really fun and really uh, full of people. <laughs> that's what I remember from GDC of last year, how it was so crowded, so much stuff, so many people everywhere, but uh, all really awesome, definitely. Very draining <laughs> to handle all of those people at the same time. But yeah, that was really awesome. And we had a little uh, meetup uh, at the Werba uh, uh, Buena Garden, something like that. I don't know. That it was last, uh, last year and it was really interesting. So yeah, hopefully next year should happen. So yeah, can't wait to see you at next UGC. Yeah, nice. Meantime, keep creating amazing games. Oh yeah, so lots of stuff here. Yeah, definitely very... Very interesting, lots of information, lots of samples you can download right now and download the Unity 6 beta. I'll definitely be doing that, so let me actually put it on install and just install that one. There you go. How big is this one? I don't know, it doesn't say the size. But yeah, it's downloading pretty fast. So yeah, definitely curious to try that out. It should be interesting. So yeah, <clears throat> you've been making a new game for Steam. Well, I still have my uh, Total War Liberation. <laughs> I still want to get back to that one at some point, so we shall see, maybe this year, and I still want to finish a bunch of things more on Thinking Gardens, so yep, we'll use Unity 6, yep, I'm definitely going to try it out. Is a 6000 beta pre-release, yep, that is the Unity 6 beta, they called it 6000, I assume it's just to keep the same format of having four digits, so what used to be 2023, now it's just going to be the 6000, so yep, pretty much like that. Should I learn game dev which university? I'm sorry, that's a very local question. Uh, I have no idea. I would say learn from watching channels like mine and others and then find a local university that teaches something. Although I would probably advise more going into just general uh, software development as opposed to specifically game design, something like that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah, definitely wish you the best in your learning journey. Will you bring more C-Shop course? Yeah, I'm still about to... Still got a bunch of work to do on my on my C Sharp course. I've actually been building some interactive exercises. But uh, yeah, so the Unity 6 roadmap, this was actually, it looks quite interesting. I'm definitely quite quite interested in the future, especially all this looks really awesome. Basically making everything run much snappier, much better. That is 100% a positive thing. All right, so yeah, it's already pretty late over here. It's 8 p.m., so yeah, I gotta take my dogs outside, do something. So yeah, this was a fun live stream. I mean, I... I saw the uh, video going live and I figured, hey, doing this on a live stream could be fun, could be interesting. So hopefully you found this a bit more interesting than just watching by yourself. So I hope that you enjoyed this live stream. And uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you all so much for being here. And I'm going to just move this like that, like that. And yeah. All right. So yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed this. And all right. Uh, see you next time, everyone. Enjoy. Have a great weekend. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.